I know the domain editor for the ESV doesn't believe in the six-day creation. And Tim Keller, I don't know if you ever heard of Tim Keller. You know, he's a Presbyterian church out east somewhere. He doesn't believe, he believes in what's called theistic evolution, that God, there's a bunch of goo in a green pond, and God struck it with lightning, and all the stuff started evolving out of it. And that's what he believes. So I believe the literal, literal what the Bible says for the six days. But anyways, I don't have a meme tonight or an apologetic because I got a lot to cover here. So I just have this prophecy update, which really relates to the message. So things will not get back to normal. The word is prepared for the Antichrist. There's always a lot of people thinking, well, hey, things are going to get so much better. Now we have Trump as president and so on and so on. Well, maybe it'll hold off things a little bit, but it's not going to get better. The Antichrist right now is, I believe he's alive now already. I don't know that 100% for sure, but I believe that this world really wants to have that one world government, and they want to go do their stuff. They always talk about 2030. And so I think Trump put a kind of a, a wrench in their gears to slow things down a little bit, we think. But we'll see. So anyways, this verse here, and this is what we're covering tonight, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Believe me, when this guy comes on the scene, this Antichrist, he's going to be somebody that people are going to listen to and look up to as, you know, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, they, they really are. We won't be here. But it's, it's, and he's going to demand worship. So let's go ahead and get into our rapture message tonight. We're going to talk about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. This is our fourth of our five messages. It will be done on the 5th, and then Jason's so excited to get up here and teach on the armor of God starting the 12th, so it'll happen, everything, everything comes, but I remember thinking back two, three months ago, thinking this election, you know, it seemed like it was so far away, and now it's already came and it's passed, but that's the way life is, right? <laughs> um, so this evening we cover verse uh, 1 through 12 on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to look at the B on our pre-trib Ackerman. The B is blessed, blessed hope. We, we, that's only going to take one simple slide. And then next week we're going to, not next week, but in two weeks we're going to cover Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And that's the 70th week of Daniel. And this is the most, I believe, the most amazing prophecy in the Bible, really. If not the most amazing one, it, it, is, amazing. it is amazing. I mean, this was, prophecy was given 500 years before Christ was born. So for us, that's 2,500 years ago, and it really is an amazing prophecy when you see it. It's, it's kind of cool. And I've talked to people that have gone through and analyzed this these 70 weeks, and they, they come right down to when Jesus went into Jerusalem, not to the day because it's kind of difficult, but the kind of general, general idea of that, which is amazing. If you ask me if I could predict something that's going to happen 500 years from now, and it came within a week, you'd think, wow, that guy's a prophet but you know you can't do it how could you? you we have no idea but that's what happened in the bible and we'll talk about that and my goal is to try to make this so that we can really understand it because it, it gets a little bit complicated but it's it's yeah it's if you you can grasp it, and it it's kind of a cool thing so if you want to read before this read daniel chapter 9 before the next two weeks now the first half of daniel actually the first three quarters is about a prayer, and that is one of the most amazing prayers I ever seen in the Bible. I mean, we, I think we could read that prayer and inject that in our life or in America, and I'm not saying that's what it's for, but it was for Israel, but to think how we should pray like that. And then you get into Daniel 9, verse 24 through 27, is what we're going to cover in two weeks. So let's get into studying God's Word. And so first of all, we'll be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so first of all, I'm going to read verses 1 through 12, if you want to read along with me. And then we'll go back over these verses, uh, verse by verse, and we're going to concentrate on verse 3 a little later. So starting with verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to read through verse 12. It says here, Now I beseech you, this is the Apostle Paul writing, Now I beseech you, which is a request, which is I beg you, Brethren, this is written to save people, to Christians. You don't call unsaved people brethren in the Bible. Now we beseech you, brethren, Christians, by the coming. Coming is that word parousia, which is, means Jesus' presence. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering. That word gathering is an interesting word. It's actually, come, that's where they get the word synagogue from. And, it, and it's basically, you know, a synagogue, think of a church, a church ecclesia, how do you say it? Ecclesia, whatever, gathering together. And that's what a synagogue, they gather together, the Jewish people in, in their worship. And so this here what says, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, we'll all be gathered together unto him, that you be not soon shaken. And that word shaken means almost literally shaken, anxiety. They were afraid. Be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Um, and they were frightened. They were alarmed. Neither by spirit, I think that's an evil spirit, neither by word, a spoken word, nor by a letter. Somebody was giving these guys some false information. Either it was an evil spirit somehow doing it or somebody was saying something or they has got a letter sent to them. As from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So somebody told these people, the day of Christ is at hand. So they were afraid because they figured that means the tribulation started and we missed it. So anyways, going in verse 3, and Paul says, let no man deceive you. It's easy to get deceived. We got to know our Bibles. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, which is the day of the Lord, day of the Christ, synonymous, shall not come except there come a fallen away first, and that the man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition, son of destruction, that's the Antichrist. So it's saying right here, there has to be a fallen away first. We're going to talk about that. That's the Greek word apostasia. And then the son of perdition, the man of sin, which is the Antichrist. First they have to come on the scene before that tribulation starts. Then verse 4, who, uh, this is what this Antichrist is like. Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship. This guy, if... If you worship anything, he's going to be jealous and he's going to tell you to stop just to worship him. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan's always wanted to usurp God's authority, and so he's going to try it here in the tribulation by going in a temple in Jerusalem and call himself God. Verse 5, I think this is kind of cool, and it's funny lately when I've been studying my Bible, I've been seeing this over and over again. It says, remember you not. And I read, I'm studying Second Peter, in the first three verses of chapter 3, it says, I'm telling you this to remind you. So, and, and do this, think, when you study the next couple of reads, or you, or you read the Bible, you'll, you probably will notice, just like when you buy a new car, you always see the same type of cars, but you'll notice that it tells you that you will remember, he says, remember, remember, the Bible constantly tells us, remember this, I remind you. So he says here in verse 5, remember you not... That when I was yet with you, Paul was with these Thessalonican believers, that I told you these things about, you know, about the day of the Lord and so on. He says, I told you this stuff. Why are you forgetting? Well, I don't criticize these people because I seem to forget stuff pretty quick. You know, I just had kidney stones. They said, don't eat this, don't eat this, don't eat this. And I keep telling myself, don't forget to follow these rules. You know, it's, just, it's just so easy. And that we're like that we're, as humans. And so then it says in verse 6, and now you know what? withholdeth what holds back that he might be revealed in his time we talked about that last week we learned that that was the holy spirit that's the only one that can hold back this evil verse 7 for the mystery of iniquity a mystery in the bible is something that was not known before and is now known and this whole idea of the antichrist coming on the scene wasn't well known and now it's kind of being revealed the mystery of iniquity does already work that mystery that sin is already working i mean the antichrist whether he's alive or, or not alive today, there is that, that aura of sin in this world that's trying to achieve that purpose. Because Satan obviously is alive, right? He's trying to do it. So, so it says, only he who now lets will let, that's the Holy Spirit is allowing him to do what he can do right now, and now letteth will let until he be taken out of the wall. So as we talked about before, when the Holy Spirit gets taken out, we go with him because we're sealed. So then in verse 8, and then, then means it's something like a time stamp, right? It's telling you when. And then shall the wicked, that wicked there is the Antichrist, um, shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy, destroy with the brightness of his coming. So it's telling you right there that the ultimate demise of the Antichrist, he's going to be destroyed. And we'll talk about that a little later too. And in verse 9, even him, this is the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan. And that's because... This man is possessed by Satan <clears throat> with all power and signs and lying wonders. 
Uh, read, read Revelation chapter 13 if you get a chance because it talks all about this deceitfulness of this, this Antichrist that's coming on the scene. That's Revelation 13. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. There's people that are going to follow the Antichrist and think he's the savior of the world and they're going to reject anything to do with Christianity during the tribulation. Not everybody, but some. And I'm going to explain this because there's some people who have, I think, a, a bad, wrong, incorrect view of that verse. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There's going to be a delusion in this world that's going to deceive people during this seven-year tribulation. And so, I've got six points of an outline. So my goal is to have you a good understanding of these 12 verses. So first of all, just a six-point um, review of what we covered. First of all, this is written to Christians because it says brethren. It's about the coming of Jesus to gather them to him, right? It says we'll gather together to him. And the second point is to encourage them because of a spurious letter or information. It says from the Spirit, somebody spoke it, somebody wrote a letter that they received about them being in a tribulation which is false. They weren't. Some, somebody was lying to them and getting these guys shook up. Just like today, we always, you always hear people, they hate that pre-tribulation rapture. No, you're supposed to go through the rapture. You've got to be purified. And they say that today. Well, we're going to talk about that in a little while too. So number three, be careful about deception. For that day would not come until after the Antichrist is revealed. But in, in general, there are deceivers out there that try to deceive and try to give you false information. And verse uh, number four was Paul was reminded him that he had previously told him all this information. Now these were very young Christians, these Thessalonican Christians. First Thessalonians, second Thessalonians was probably written within six months of each other. That's, you know, at least less than a year they believe that these two letters were written. So Paul was there, he wrote them the letter, and they're already um, forgetting what he told them and getting all shook up. So now he has to write second Thessalonians. And then number five, the Antichrist and his evil agenda is being held back until it is allowed to be manifested, even though you do see this spirit of evil in the world now. I mean, we do, we see it, but it's not fully manifested, is it? But it will be. The Antichrist will be when he's allowed, you know, they, he, right now he's like he's on a, a mean dog on a leash. When that leash gets let go, that Antichrist can do whatever he wants. Then number six, the earth dwellers, we talk about this in Revelation, it uses that exact term, earth dwellers, nine times. That's the unsaved people that are hardened, that are as far left as you can get, that love this present world and all the sin of it. It says, I said, that will readily believe this lie, this delusion, because they love sin and want an ungodly Savior. They're looking for this Savior right now. They really are. I remember when, oh, Clinton, but even Obama, especially when he was president, they looked at him like he was the greatest thing ever. And so the world is looking for some kind of savior. And when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's not going to have too much problems of people falling in line with him, thinking that he's the one that's going to take care of this world. So let's go back now to verse 1. And verse 1, as it said, Paul said, Now we beseech you, we beg you, brethren, that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, so he said there, as you notice on the screen, now we beseech, we ask, we request you, brethren, referring to Christians. Whenever you see brethren, that's referring to Christians. By the coming, that's a parousia, presence, it means presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, and by our gathering together unto him, a gathering together in one place, I'm not going to say that word, which means synagogue, um, but it's like, the, the religious assembly of Christians. We get together in church, we assemble together. And that's what that word synagogue means. It means assembling together in a group. And so that's what he's talking about when he says gathering together. And then remember back in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it tells us, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that word is the word hama but it means at the same time at once together. So synagogue, as you see in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, but in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it's the same thing. We'll be caught up together. It's not like um, Tony's going to go first, and then a couple hours later, Jason's going to go. No, we're all going to go together, right? 
everybody. We're going to go up together just like that in a twinkling of an eye. It's going to be a wonderful, absolute wonderful thing. And when this is going to happen, God knows, right? <laughs> so, um, verse 2. In verse 2, it, it tells us, I'm going to read it again. It says that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, don't, don't be all shook up. It hasn't happened yet. And then he goes on and explains what has to happen first. Because they were thinking somebody was telling them or wrote them a letter that you are in, you're going into the tribulation. Now, how would you feel? You know, I'd go at home and I'd hide under my table or something. Remember in school when they talked about nuclear war, you're supposed to get under your desk? <laughs> Protect yourself. Funny, isn't it? But you think about it, you know, what are you going to do? When the tribulation comes, you're not going to hide. You're not going to get away from it. You know, we can be thankful that we will be taken to heaven. But anyways, the bullet points here that you not be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, and I believe that's an evil spirit, what he's referring to, nor by word, that's logos, which means spoken word, or by letter, as from us. There's a pseudo letter, a fake letter, or something being written. Somehow these people got some false information that was wrong, and Paul's trying to get that corrected. That the day of Christ is at hand. Day of Christ, the day of the Lord, they're synonymous. And so the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, what that means is, um, if you study the Old Testament versus New Testament, you come to the conclusion that that is right at, at the point of the rapture, and it ends at the great white throne judgment, when everybody gets cast into hell. So it covers the tribulation, the millennial kingdom. That's referred to as the day of the Lord, that time period. So once the rapture comes, it starts, and once the great white throne judgment ends, Remember in Revelation 20, verse 15, it, it's over. Um, and I think the rapture, if you just look at Revelation for a book, it probably would be Revelation 4, 1, when that door is open, possibly. And then it ends in Revelation 20, verse 15. But the day of the Lord covers the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. And day of Christ means the same thing. And so they thought that, hey, we are getting into this tribulation. They were scared that the rapture had taken place, and yet they were still there. Remember in 1972, when there's a song by Larry Norman, and it was, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. Remember that song? It's kind of a cool song back then when you think about it. But it, it's, it's like that's what was happening here. These guys would be, you know, I wish you all been ready. Because they thought that Christ had came or that it happened already, and they were stuck. They feared they were going to go through the seven-year tribulation. That's what the great fear here was. That's what their... Um, agonizing over and it wasn't true they were being lied to so verse number three and we're looking at this now but we're going to come back and look at this here again a little later but verse three paul said to them let no man deceive you by any means for that day the day of the lord shall not come except there come a fallen away first so there has to be this falling away so we have to find out what that means and that the man of sin be revealed. And so there has to be this man of sin, which is the Antichrist. Them two things. The man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. Son of destruction is what that really means. And so he's an evil person that just wants to destroy. And people get deceived by him. So the bullet points, let no man deceive you by any means. Be very careful about experiences or so-called experts or scholars. I mean, these guys that have their doctor's degrees. Now, yes. After a while, when you get to know somebody and you listen to them and you study your Bible, there's certain people you can trust, right? For the most part. You always should still to check things with the scriptures. But after a while, you kind of get to the point where this guy I like, he's pretty good, and, and he's teaching the Bible verse by verse, and I can trust him. Other people you listen to for a while, and you say, uh, something's not right here. So, but anyways, before you trust anyone, they should gain your trust. It takes time. Um... Sometimes you'll listen to a message and they'll give a good message and the next time they'll go and say something that was completely wrong. So don't believe everything on Google that you search for, on AI, or even DuckDuckGo. Duck, they, say, they say use DuckDuckGo because that's, that's a good one. I, I still be careful. The only thing I think we can truly believe today is this book, this Bible, God's Word. So we need to be careful about that. But as on the screen it says, for that day... The day of the Lord shall not come except for these two things here. First, 
except there come a fallen away first. And number two, that the son of man, the sin, the son of man, the sin be, man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. So a fallen away and the Antichrist. These things have to happen first. And Paul's basically telling them, this has not happened yet. And so the fallen away is that word apostasy, the Greek word, and that's where we get the word apostasy. And so I'm going to talk about this a little bit because this is kind of interesting. Apostasia means a fallen away, a departure, apostasia. Okay, so that's the meaning of that word which is translated as fallen away here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Man of sin, the son of perdition, is that antichrist, that one world leader that everybody's going to fall for and think he's, he's going to take straighten this world out. And then first, though, there has to be a fallen away and then also the Antichrist must be revealed. So I keep saying this over and over again, but by the time we're done here, I think you have a good grasp of this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So verse 4, as we move on, and we're going to come back to verse 3 in a little while. But verse 4 says this, Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, said in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he goes in the rebuilt third Jewish temple that's going to be rebuilt. They have all the supplies for it. They want to rebuild it. Right now there's an Islam dome of the rock there that something has to be figured out so they can rebuild their temple. But it'll, don't worry, that's going to be all resolved. And they're going to build the third temple. And the Jews are going to try worshiping in this temple. And it's, it's really this temple is not ordained of God because they're building this temple out of unbelief, right? I mean, there shouldn't be a temple anymore. Not the Holy Spirit's a temple within us. But anyways, they're going to build that third temple during the tribulation time period. And it could go up, they say, within six months to a year if they get the okay on that pretty quick. But the Antichrist is going to go in there in the midpoint of the tribulation and basically defile it. Now, this happened once before back in the second temple when Antiochus Epiphanius went in there and just defiled it, slaughtered a pig on the temple, I guess. So, you see here, um, cures at the midpoint of the tribulation. Where am I? 2-3. I should be on 2-4. Okay, there we are. Who opposes and exalts himself with what is called God, or that is worship. He's very jealous, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, um, and showing himself that he is God. Showing himself means he declares himself that he is God. He sits in that temple and says, I'm God. And this occurs at the midpoint of the tribulation, and back in Matthew chapter 24, it talks about this. It says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, as another name for the Antichrist, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's what Daniel called him, stand in the holy place, whoso reads this, let him understand. And that's back in Daniel 9, 27, and that's what we're going to cover in a couple of weeks. Okay, so this guy's a megalomaniac. He's a narcissist, and he thinks the world revolves around him, and he's in love with himself. Have you ever met anybody like that? <laughs> you know, it's it's once in a while you run into somebody like that, and it's not they're not a pleasure to be around because they they want all the attention. Okay, so verse five. Verse five tells us. This is where he reminds me. He says, "Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things." So he's saying basically, I I give you this information. Now there's people that say we should not teach Christians young Christians especially, about prophecy, about things that can happen in the future. But Paul did. Paul taught these Thessalonican young believers about prophecy. And we should know it, and we should study it. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that on Sunday when we cover in Revelation chapter 22. But it says here, Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And as I said before, how soon we tend to forget. He talked about the pro he talked about prophecy, the rapture, the day of the Lord. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10 he says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath to come is the coming tribulation. Then in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, and in verse 11, he says, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Now, salvation is soteria. It doesn't always mean saved from hell. It could be saved from anything. And it means deliverance, it means safety. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, wherefore comfort yourself together. Notice together again, we all should comfort each other. And edify one another, let's encourage each other, let's lift each other up, even as you also you do. 
And then remember in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 17, it talks about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 17. And in verse 18, it says this. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Because Christ is going to come and take us to heaven, that's something we can be comfort each other about, right? If he wasn't, and he was going to go to the, through the, what, could you imagine, you're going through the tribulation, comfort yourself with this. You're going through the tribulation. I don't think so, but many people don't like this teaching doctrine of the rapture. So let's look at verse 6 and 7. In verse 6, it says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, And now you know what withholdeth, what holds back, that he might be revealed in his time. Um, the Holy Spirit is holding back the workings of the Antichrist, and then he'll be revealed. Verse 7 says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, we see sin throughout this world right now. We know that it's trying to manifest what it can right now. Only he, the Holy Spirit, who now lets, will let until the Holy Spirit be taken out of his way. So I added that in there it, as somewhat of a commentary in verse 7. So know what holds, withholds, that uh, prevents this evil entity and agenda. In other words, the Antichrist agenda is being held back. Like I said, it's like a bulldog that has a leash on him. It's being holding it back. That he might be revealed in his time. There's a time when God's going to allow the Antichrist to be revealed and do what he has to do. For the mystery of iniquity or wickedness does already work. Now, here's what I think. If the Antichrist man is alive today, and he may be, he is doing something evil, okay? You know, whoever you can try to guess who it is, and as you guess who it is, it's probably somebody that's, that's pretty evil or has some kind of agenda that they're working on right now in planning. But he's not allowed to um, bring it to fruition until later. And it says, only he who now will, let, will, let, will allow the Holy Spirit hold him back until he, the Holy Spirit, be taken out of the way. So if the Holy Spirit's being taken out of the way, we're sealed the Holy Spirit will be taken too. Um, right now, this Antichrist is being impeded. He's being held back, right? So in Ephesians 1.13, uh, the second part of it, it says, In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You and I are sealed. Sealed, God seals us, means you're sealed. You're stamped, you're His. And in John 14.16, and I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, comforter is the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. That Holy Spirit is with you forever. Um, uh, I think it's Ephesians 4.30, says until the day of redemption, we get taken to heaven, we're redeemed. But he's going to be with us forever. We're going to be with the Holy Spirit, God, Father, the Son, for all eternity, forever. And so that's a, that John chapter 14, verse 16, is really a verse of comfort, isn't it? Okay, so verse 8. Verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says this, And then, this is after the rapture really is what I'm saying, shall the wicked be revealed, the Antichrist be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the Antichrist is going to be destroyed by Jesus Christ when he comes back at the second coming. And as we saw on the screen, then shall that wicked and another interpretation would be the lawless one. He breaks all laws of God's. He just desires to break all God's law. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. He just has to speak the word and the Antichrist is destroyed. Um, and that's going to happen in Revelation 19, 19, Revelation 19, 20. The battle of Armageddon lasts about that long. And that's about it. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So when the Holy Spirit and us, the church is removed, harpazo, we talk about harpazo there, mean caught up in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. It doesn't mean raped, like that one guy said. But when the Holy Spirit, church is removed, caught up, harpazo, the Antichrist then will be revealed after that, okay? So, these both of these people, the at the second coming, the Antichrist and the false prophet, they're both going to be cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone when Christ comes back at the end of Armageddon. That's in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Now, the Antichrist, gets ca the Antichrist and the false prophet get cast into hell alive in Revelation 19, 20, after the battle of Armageddon. But Satan is a spirit being, isn't he? So Satan says, I'm leaving you. And then in Revelation 20, verse 1, 
actually Satan gets put into that bottomless pit, remember? Puts in the bottomless pit there, and he's in that bottomless pit for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom, then he gets released. But then when he gets released, pretty soon, Revelation 20, verse 10, he's cast into that lake of fire where the false prophet and Antichrist have already been for 1,000 years, okay? So that's basically the end of Satan in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, okay? When he gets cast into that lake of fire. But this is talked about in the Old Testament. And it's cool as you study the Old Testament, the more you learn the Bible, the more you study it, the more you put this all together. But Isaiah 14, verse 12, and verse 15 says this, talking about Satan, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So Isaiah inspired by the Holy Spirit, is telling what's going to happen to this Lucifer, and it does happen to him in Revelation 20, verse 1, when he gets cast in the bottomless pit, and then later he gets cast in the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Okay, so let's look at verse 9 and 10 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him, that's referring to the Antichrist, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, that's because he's possessed, with all power and signs and lying wonders. I mean, this guy can deceive anybody. I mean, he's a master deceiver. Did you ever listen to somebody and they sound so absolutely wonderful and you think, this guy can never be somebody that's a bad person because just the way they talk and just the way they say things. And so, in verse 10 then it says, and with all deceivableness, and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. People reject the truth, and they're not going to be saved because they reject it. So here we see even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. The, the Antichrist is a perfect man that Satan has chosen to possess and to be that world leader. It says, with all power and signs and lying wonders. That takes me back to John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and says, you're liars, you're liars just like Satan, the devil is. And he refers to the devil as the father of lies. In other words, he's a master liar. John chapter 8, verse 44. And then it says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. And so there are those that love this present world, and they're hardened against God. These are the ones that won't be saved, okay? Because they're not going to listen to Christ. I mean, the very some people will, you know, come to their senses, and that's what I hope when the rapture comes that people have I've talked to or shared the gospel with that they'll think, hey, he was right. We need to come and trust Christ as Savior. But there are others that are going to be hardened and cold against this, and it won't listen at all. And you see that right now in this world. Right now, there are those that are just building up this animosity against the things of God. But John thirteen nineteen. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. There are certain people that, you know, anybody can get saved, right? But there are some people that are just so hardened. And sometimes these people miraculously do get saved because they come to their senses and they realize Christ died for them. But many times they're hardened. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Nowhere does it says that, those that heard the gospel and didn't believe before the rapture won't believe after the rapture. I don't know why people said, say that or, or come up with that idea, but there are those that say, if you've heard the gospel and you don't trust Christ as Savior and a tribulation starts, you can't be saved. I, I don't agree with that. I mean, Jack Hibbs teaches that even. And I, I've heard that by other people personally that I knew personally teach that. But I, I think that it's not talking about us now is talking about during the tribulation that there's people that get hardened against Christ and they don't get saved. You know, they, they just don't. But there's always that graciousness. You read Revelation um, um, chapter 20, 21, 22. In 22 it says, you know, that he's always um, wants people to become to him to be saved. So what it says in those that don't receive the love of the truth, they won't be saved, they will be deceived. So there are people that won't be saved because they don't want to be saved. They're not interested. And that's the truth. It has nothing to do with them hearing or not hearing the gospel before the tribulation. I mean, wouldn't that be an awful thing that just because you heard the gospel and you didn't trust them, that you can't trust them later on. Now, there are those that are going to be hardened because they're going to allow themselves to be deceived. 
So let's look at verse 11 and 12. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, well, we're not, yeah, who would believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we see here, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned. Those who will be damned are those who believe not the truth. Who's damned? Those that don't believe the truth. Okay, that's what the Bible says. But they had pleasure in unrighteousness. They were interested. Okay, but the Bible tells us over and over again that there will be people saved during the tribulation. These are the people that are earth dwellers in Revelation 6.16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. These are people that have turned, they don't care about Christ at all. And they're saying, I'm gonna, we're going to try to hide from him. And they're, they're not going to trust Christ the Savior. They don't want to. They, they get that hatred built up in them. They worship the Antichrist. Christ. In Revelation 13 verse 4, 13 verse 8, and 13 verse 12, 13.4 says they worship the dragon, which is, you know, Satan. 13.8, um, they worship the Antichrist. And then in 13.12, it says they worship the beast because the false prophet deceives them. And you know in Revelation 14, verse 9 through 11, it says if you take the mark of the beast, you are doomed. If you take that 666 mark, you're doomed, according to Revelation 14, verse 9 through 11. So the ones that take that, they basically signed their allegiance over to Satan. And they won't be saved. But the Bible shows us in many, many places that millions are saved and martyred during the tribulation. Millions. Revelation 6 verse 9 um, says there, all these people are under the altar in heaven that were, were martyred. Uh, Revelation 7 verse 9, it says there's so many they can't be, they can't be numbered. Revelation 7 9. Then Revelation 14 Verse 12 and 13, it says those that are being martyred in the tribulation, they're blessed. Because basically, they had a lot going against them, yet they still said, I am not going to take the mark of the beast, and I'm going to keep my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust him. I believe that he was the Messiah. But they're going to be martyred because of that. And then in Revelation 15, verse 2, it talks about them singing in heaven, these ones that are martyred. And in Revelation 20, verse 4, it talks about how one of the methods of killing these people was to behead them. And, you know, chop off their heads. How that's going to be exactly done by guillotine or what, I don't know that for sure. But the truth is, millions are saved during the tribulation and millions are martyred. Some of these saved people will live to the end of the tribulation. Okay, they'll go into populate the millennial kingdom. So, I disagree with that idea that if you didn't get saved before the tribulation, you can't get saved after the tribulation. I think the ones that heard the gospel before the tribulation and then they see what happens, are more likely to trust Christ, that Savior, at that point, because they've heard it before. You know, otherwise it just kind of seems like it's backwards to me. So let's go back to verse 3. Talk about verse 3 of, Reve of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And that verse 3 said this, Let no man deceive you by any means. That day shall not come except the coming of fallen away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, I've talked, this is my third time talking about verse 3, but I want to go through it in a little more detail. As I have it on the screen there, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day will not come except there come a fallen away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, so that day is the day of the Lord. It starts with the rapture, continues through the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. Okay, that, that day of the Lord it refers to a time period, okay? Rapture, through, tribulation through the millennial kingdom, and I believe it ends at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, verse 15. But, two things must occur before the day of the Lord starts. There has to be a falling away, and the Antichrist has to be revealed, right? That's what you see there in these verses. The tribulation will not start until these two requirements, requirements occur. So let's take a little deeper look at this idea of falling away. I think we're pretty clear on who the Antichrist is, right? Pretty simple. Now that's talking about him there. But let's talk about this falling away because there's two different ideas on this. And we'll talk about that word apostasy. So falling away is the Greek word. It's the apostasia. And if you look it up, 
it, he means a fallen away, a departure, apostasia. And so in verse 3, it's translated as fallen away. This word as a noun is only used uh, two times in the New Testament. In Acts 21.21, 21, 21, it, refers to, it refers to people that they forsook Moses. So the word apostasia there is translated as forsook in um, Acts 21.21. 21. They physically rejected Moses is what they're saying. Okay, so the two views here, a spiritual defection from correct biblical teaching to false teaching. That's the majority belief. The majority of people believe that there's going to be such great apostasy and then the um, Antichrist will be revealed. Now we as pre pre believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, we believe we'll be raptured at that point. But we'll talk about this in just a second. The second view is it's a physical departure from the earth to heaven, i.e. the rapture. That's what fallen away means. Now, if you've never heard that before, that sounds kind of strange. But let me go through this. I'm going to give you three reasons here in just a minute why I believe that is true. There's, there's, a, there's more than that. There's a uh, few others that can be presented. But um, if it can be proven that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 is referring to the rapture, then the debate over pre-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib is settled because it says it happens before the tribulation. So I say it has to be pre-trib, and, and if, it is, if this is true, then that's the final nail in the coffin about it being pre-tribulation rapture. So my examination of reasons for believing this refers to the rapture, and I think when I first started believing this was probably 20 to 30 years ago so, or so. I don't know if it's something that I read and understood it, and so, but I've kind of always thought that. But I, the more I study it, the more I see it. And so here's my first point. Number one, if it's talking about falling away from spiritual teaching the truth, can you clearly delineate when a spiritual departure or an apostasy has occurred? Doesn't apostasy go like this, slowly get worse, worse, and worse, and worse? How can you say, does, does apostasy go like this? Bam, it's here. No, it doesn't. So, biblical history, Genesis 3, you know that what Adam and Eve did, right? Everything was perfect, and they did what they did. At that point, yeah, you say, hey, this happened. They turned against God. They committed that sin. But 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul said, they all turned away from me in Asia Minor. It's talking about all the people there turned away from me. And then Acts 20, verse 28 through 31, it talks about, he's saying, he's warning people about false teachings coming. So as you go through the Bible and you talk about apostasy, meaning... Uh, departure from true teaching or faith, you see that all the way back in the first century, don't you? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Jude chapter um, 1 verse 3. In Jude 1 verse 3 it says this, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, in other words, Jude wanted to write about salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So even back then, in the first century, Jude says people were departing from the true teaching, and I'm going to have to get, teach you this stuff to you to get you straightened out. So as you see, the idea of spiritual depart, but departure from truth, or not believing truth, or basically apostatizing what the Bible teaches, we see that all through the Bible, don't we? Over and over again. Haven't we seen this all through history, even, you know, through the... Uh, Catholicism when it started and then even today we see that with the Laodicean church and we see today that apostasy is getting worse and worse and worse and there's very few people that actually get up and teach the Bible verse by verse and explain what it really means they usually pick a topic and they talk about a topic and they don't say anything that will offend anybody so to understand when apostasy really occurs like it says they're falling away how can you know for sure determine? That's, that's, that's one of my things. Is I don't see how you can say apostasy exactly happened at this point. And let me move on. We'll, we'll see this a little better here in a second. Let me go through my second one. What is the context? What is the context that we're talking about here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Well, when he wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10... 219, 413 through 18, you know that's the rapture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. What does 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 says? He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. 
we see that the whole context he's talking about in 1 Thessalonians, and then starting in 1st, 2 Thessalonians, he's talking about the rapture. He's talking about the coming of Jesus. They are all speaking of the rapture of the church. Here's what I think is kind of interesting. Notice in verse 3, it says there, a falling away first. A falling away first. Okay, and I'm saying that means not a spiritual departure. I'm saying it means a physical departure. In other words, we depart this world. We're gone. Like that. Here's the word proton. You know what the word proton is, right? Protons in the nucleus of an atom. Okay, you have the protons and the neutrons. Protons are positive. Neutrons are neutral. That's the nucleus. You have the electrons orbiting around it. And all these together make up what you call a molecule. But it means first in time, place, order, and importance. Not gradual, but instantaneous. A falling away first. Now let me show you one thing that I think supports this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it, that word there is atomos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's, that's the word atom. So basically, in a moment, it's saying it's the smallest time. You can't, if you take and divide up an atom, you don't have an atom anymore, do you? So basically, when that twinkling of an eye there is basically is something that happens instantaneously, immediately. And so now we have, that's the word where we get the word Adam. Isn't it funny back here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, they were, used the word proton. Can you divide up a, pro, can you divide up a word proton? No, it's, it's, you can't. So I, I, to, when I look at this, I see that to, this departure has to be something that's instantaneous. It can't be something that's gradual. And then, because we don't know when apostasy is. If you had asked me 10 years ago, I'd say the apostasy is already here. 20 years ago, it's already here. It's just something that continually goes out through the world from the first century on. They've had problems with it. So that's my first two reasons. Here's one of my third reason. I think I have four of these. Old English Bibles. You know how they, that word, how they used to translate it? They translated the Wycliffe Bible in 1384 and all these like six or seven old Bibles that translate this way as departing. Tyndale Bible, the Old English, departing. I don't, and then um, Geneva Bible, 1599, they translated that as departing. They didn't translate it as falling away. And you can go and look up at these and find that. It's kind of interesting. Now here's what I heard, and I can't verify this or prove this true. Supposedly, when the Reformation started and Martin Luther and Calvin and all these guys broke away from the Catholic Church, that the Catholics went and when they wrote their, I think it was called the Douay Rhymes or something, Bible that they wrote, that they put in there about the Protestants falling away from the Catholic Church. And ever since then, when he wrote the King James and all Bibles since then, they put in there falling away apostasy. That's what apostasy I mean, means depart from the faith. So I, I find that when you look at that, it's kind of interesting to think about it because these Bibles were saying departing. And I think departing, being raptured, fits more the context than it does as far as things get worse and worse as far as apostasy. Okay, so you agree, agree with me or don't agree with me, it's something to think about. But the next one here I have is the last one, Bible scholars. Now I'm not saying just because somebody claims to be a Bible scholar that you listen to them, but six out of seven of these guys I respect very much. Maybe five out of seven, but anyways, John R. Rice. How have you ever heard of John R. Rice? John R. Rice was an old-time fundamentalist, and he said it like it is. Um, he died in 1980. He was a Baptist evangelist. He uh, he was very fundamental, very strong preacher, and he believed that that was talking about the rapture of the church there falling away. Kenneth Woost, who. Uh, He's uh, one of these Greek scholars, and that's what he says. Um, I've got his four-volume volume set of uh, word studies in the Greek New Testament. Um, I haven't used it that much. Uh, there's a couple things that I kind of have a problem with him about his, what he, his gospel and so on. But either way, he's, he believes that that is, should be interpreted as the rapture. E. Schuler English, I think a lot of you have heard of him before. Um, he was 1930. He was a president of Philadelphia School of the Bible. Um, he believes that Dwight, Dwight Pentecost. I like. He I like his book. Thanks to come. It's one of the best books I've ever read on prophecy. 
Um, he was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. Actually, he was Andy Woods' professor. Andy Woods, as who's I've got at the last one, G. But then Tim, Le, Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye had, has written like 85 books, they claim. You know, you know the Left Behind series? You know, I know he had some liberties with how he did the prophecy and about these things here. But he believes that it was the rapture, speaking of the rapture. Thomas Ice, a theologian, he wrote an uh, excellent book on the Olivet Discourse. And I think we, we listened to him at Calvary Chapel. He spoke there when they had the prophecy conference there. And Andy Woods, we all know, actually, um, Keller would not be coming to our church if it wasn't for Andy Woods because Keller likes Andy Woods. And he looked on our website and he's seen one of my messages where I had a meme about Andy Woods. And Andy Woods is the uh, pastor of Sugarland Bible Church in, in Texas. And, and very good. I, I respect him a lot. A lot of good stuff. But he also believes that this is, refer in fact, he wrote a book on this about these ideas that this refers to the um, rapture of the church. So to me, I don't say you can say that this is 100% convincing, but I think it's interesting. And I think it makes as much sense as the apostasy coming in a sense of falling away from the faith because it, I think it's something that has to be delineated pretty clear. And apostasy never is that way. Apostasy is something that takes over time. So here, if you interpret that as a departure, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 would say this, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there become a departure first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So that departure would be the rapture. It has to be the rapture first, then the Antichrist is revealed, okay? So if, that's, if I interpret that correctly, basically this is proven that pre-tribulation or rapture is true. Not everybody's going to agree with me, I understand that. But here's what I want to say next, and listen to this. I sat and I thought about this and thought about this. Why do, and I mentioned this before, why does Satan, or why do these people today want us not to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? Why? Well, here's what I think. Satan's a master deceiver. When the rapture occurs, does he want people to go, uh-oh, I need to investigate my faith. I should have listened to these people. Or does he want so-called Christians to think they are supposed to go through the tribulation? Satan wants people to be as deceived as long as he can. So they're thinking, I'm, a, I'm supposed to go through the tribulation, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So these people that are gone, I don't know what happened to them. There's going to be an explanation. UFOs came and got them, or the New Age, something or other, got rid of these people. And so I think Satan does not want to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Because if... if People believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, and it occurs. Aren't people going to say, you know what? These people were right, and they interpret the Bible for what, and Jesus took these people to heaven. We better come to know Christ as our Savior pretty quick. But I think he doesn't want that to happen. He, I think he wants these people to think, yeah, these people, I don't know where they are, but we Christians are still here. We're going to go through this tribulation. And Satan wants them to believe that they're still that they're Christians. I mean, think about something. Think about that, because lay in bed at night and try to think, why does Satan want people not to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? Because it's a big thing that they attack people today. But So that's what I have for tonight. Kind of interesting. Can, I'm, I'm not done yet. Well, for that, now we've got to look at the B. The blessed hope. Just take two seconds. Oh. Okay, so pre-trib, that acronym was place of the church, the rapture versus return, exemption from God's wrath, and the T was time gap in between. R was removal of the restrainer. I was imminency of the rapture. And the B is the blessed hope. So just real quick, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then 1 Thessalonians 4.18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. What are these words? The words that he just spoke in the past last, the verse four verses before that. Then John 14, verse one through three, we talked about last week. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. He's at the right hand of God, oh Father, God the Father in heaven. He's going to take us there to be with him in heaven. I mean, that, that's pretty clear if you ask me. So, if you don't know Christ as Savior, trust him now. Don't wait till the tribulation because, you know, you never know. You could be gone just like that. 
but tr you can trust him at any time, but don't be deceived. Go, people should come to know Christ as personal Savior now as soon as possible. So that's what I have for tonight.